calculated the saving by subtracting the uh, savings, sorry, by subtracting the after consumption from the before consumption, and then we compared that between, uh, we looked at the difference between that saving and zero, rather than comparing the difference between two large and only slightly different numbers. And then secondly, we set a p-value, uh, or a kind of threshold at which we decided whether there was a significant saving or not at 0.1. Now, um, the, the previous study mentioned 95% and 0.05 p-value, um, and that's the kind of number that you see in most uh, biomedical studies, and it's kind of used as a default in most statistical analyses. We decided to set it a little bit higher at 0.1. Now, that would potentially create more false positives where we say that there's a save in there that actually isn't but we decided that that was worth the risk given that you know this is water efficiency we're talking about and not um, trying to save people's lives and um, so um, that's how we overcame the, the challenge of detecting signal uh, signal in the noise. The actual analysis uh, was based on uh, meter reads uh, either build meter reads or more short duration before and after uh, meter reads uh, using um, a most most of the time using a before and after control so the um, the approach was that the, um, the people who would get the intervention would be monitored for a period before uh, they received the water efficiency device and then for a period after they received it and then the analysis I've described would take place. Um, that's, that's effective in the, well, for two reasons. One, it's cost effective. Um, you need a, a relatively smaller sample of, of people. Uh, and secondly, it removes some of, the, um, some of the external factors that may influence those uh, con consumption in that sample because you're dealing with the same households. Now, there is obviously the, uh, the risk that other things that are going on might get missed uh, over time, such as weather influence, school holidays, and so on. And so, um, where possible, we looked at side-by-side uh, -side control as well, where there was another group of people who were monitored for a period throughout, you know, throughout that before and after period. Um, that happened in two or three uh, of the studies that we analysed, and it did show some slightly different results, uh, and that's reported in, in, in the uh, project report, which you can look at a bit further if you're interested. But we, we believe that uh, before and after control is, is adequate and, and good and useful way of doing uh, the, the study design for water efficiency research. So as I say, we undertook standard analysis for all of the projects that were analysed in, in the study. Um, for each of them we produced these uh, standard tables and a, a descriptive summary at the bottom of, of what the results were. Um, I can't remember which one this is from, uh, but we've got a uh, a sample number, we did some exclusion analysis to uh, take out um, results that seemed erroneous, uh, either in terms of the percentage or absolute change in consumption before and after. Um, and then we tested for normality, uh, which is necessary if you're using uh, the statistical tests that we use, the t-test, uh, it requires uh, assumption of normal or near normal data. Uh, so we used skewness and kurtosis to test for normality uh, and then presented a range of descriptive statistics as you can see there and then under, undertook the t-test to determine whether the savings observed were statistically significant or not. And then we put all of this together to produce this um, meta-analysis of results and um, I've got a few minutes to, to run through this. There's quite a lot of information in here which uh, is, is you know, quite a lot of this figure can reveal. So we've got uh, a total of 25 uh, water efficiency schemes down the uh, left hand side and the mean water saving litres per property per day on the x-axis. Important to note that zero is there um, initially and then for each of the studies we've got a dot and uh, some bars. So the dot is the mean saving from each of those individual studies and the bars are the confidence intervals. And any study that's got bars that go to the left of zero, uh, effectively it's not statistically significant uh, saving. The third main thing you can see is this orange-yellow diamond. That's effectively the weighted mean saving from all of those studies. 
That includes the seven studies from the phase one project that I mentioned earlier, the 2012 project, plus the nine indi individual uh, phases of the uh, Essex and Suffolk Water H2 Eco study, which are all a little bit different, uh, and then the, the nine studies that we, uh, other studies that we identified uh, from this project. So the mean saving across all of those is 13 and a half litres per property per day, or about three and a half percent of um, consumption. It seems quite small, uh, encouraging, but what you've got to remember is, is that that's based on a kind of warts and all analysis. So some of these studies uh, are very small uh, sample of properties, down to about 50, uh, and so there are areas in which that saving can be improved and you can see that by looking at some of the individual um, projects for example Essex and Suffolk phase five or six um, was starting to get pretty advanced and sophisticated and focused on a new kind of what the savings are and, and the approach to the water efficiency trial and uh, engagement with the customers and so on that they were interested in and throughout the uh, Essex and Suffolk projects you can see a general trend towards a, an improving saving so we're learning as we go along. And just at the bottom here, we've got two of the Dimitrin uh, studies with the angling water in home display, where, as you'd expect, the saving between some a customer who's already metered and then a customer who gets a in home display is relatively small, but still interesting and worth further investigation. And then we've got quite a whopping saving here from the South East Water Customer Metering Program uh, of around 70 litres per property per day. A couple of things to say about that. Um, it's got a very large confidence interval around it. The main reason for that is that we're looking at a before and after and for metering studies uh, in the, in the uh, large most cases, we don't actually know what the individual consumption is at, at those properties that become metered. And so that uh, pre-metering consumption is based on um, domestic consumption monitors or, or billing data or whatever. So it's a, an average of a, a very large uh, set of data. So we'll come back to that in terms of recommendations, but a large saving. And the eagle eye amongst you might have realized that there were three metering projects involved in this study. Only two are presented here. The third one is the Southern Water Universal Metering Project. Uh, that was uh, data that we weren't able to access directly. Um, so Southampton University were doing a, a report for Southern on the uh, savings from their program. Now they reported a, a pretty similar number uh, in the range of about uh, 65 litres per property per day, so in the range of 16 to 18%, which is consistent with the South East Water saving. But we didn't want to put it on this chart because we didn't have all the stats behind it to present the confidence intervals and so on. But interesting result there from those two uh, large-scale metering projects. So a few conclusions. Uh, on average, uh, water efficiency programs save water. Mean saving of 13 and a half litres per property per day across all of those projects, kind of warts and all. Um, southeast and southern water uh, metering uh, savings are largely consistent. <coughs> The other thing that's missing from that meta-analysis was rainwater and greywater evidence, and there wasn't really enough uh, from our review to make firm conclusions. Now, in terms of how to get the most out of your water efficiency programme, those points seem like uh, stating the bleeding obvious, perhaps, um, but it's backed up by evidence now that if you go out and identify the, uh, the most effective device, which Essex and Suffolk have done with, H, uh, with the EcoBeta, target households that will use it the most and then install it as cost effectively as possible, then you're likely to achieve savings at the upper end of that range that was presented in, in the previous diagram. And again, just picking out a few other highlights from uh, H2ECO, back in the midst of time, just after that original upgrade project I presented earlier, we, we did another project. Um, that was looking at the sustainability of water efficiency savings over a long period of time. And the company I worked for back then came up with this concept of half-lives. I think I was working with a physicist on, on the project. <laughs> uh, and so we, we modelled a kind of half-life of savings. Um, and what the evidence from H2ECO shows, and it reflects Andy's point that you know if the evidence changes, then perhaps we need to change our views, is that 
Sabin have actually appeared to stabilise after a, a drop from the first couple of years when people are maybe keen and conscious of what's been installed in the property. But after that initial drop, they do tend to stabilise over a three or four year period. And that, that's from, uh, I think, H2 Eco phases one to five, where those devices have been in place for two, three, four, five years. In terms of who saves the most water, um, some of the analysis that we presented in the report shows that uh, urban adversity households save most, um, perhaps they're the most amenable to change, perhaps it's through the, the um, installation in, in social housing where we can uh, get to a large number of properties quite quickly, I'm not sure of the, the mechanisms there. And also properties with an occupancy of three save the most water, and again, not sure why, but maybe I would um, suggest it's that with the size of three you've got a small enough household that people within the household can communicate with each other perhaps that household is still uh, forming you know perhaps it's a bit like Dave's household in that they've got a young a very young child and, and not like my household where I've got a teenage daughter um, and then just back to that point about the consumption of unmeasured households need to be measured before meters are installed if we're going to improve them the, the estimates of, of meter save of meter program savings a couple of last slides, um, rainwater, grey water, we only identified one valid household scale study uh, with water company involvement um, from our research as part of this project uh, and when this project was produced uh, there was limited data available from that, although that did indicate that grey water recycling could save in the region of 11% of the potable water supplied into households. We knew that this was going to be a challenging area, so what we did was a, an early literature review of rainwater and grey water projects in the UK. We identified around 100 papers, which were illustrated by that green square at the bottom there. Um, but then we were surprised to find that of those 100 papers, only five or six, which is the purple square, top right corner, actually included any empirical evidence based on measurement. The rest were based on uh, calculation estimates, uh, manufacturer um, published numbers and so on. So, um, good bad news in one way, but good news in another for one of our team who um, got herself on a trip to Berlin with uh, the What F guys and a number of you others uh, to investigate water fish, uh, rainwater harvesting, grey water recycling a little bit further. As ever, the Germans are ahead of us technologically uh, in this area. One of the interesting things is that even given their um, uber efficiency, uh, it was only working really effectively in this sort of apartment block and the real savings were being achieved through uh, recovery of heat from, um, from hot water um, and not necessarily just from the, the grey water recycling. So, um, final slide, a call for evidence of water, uh, water savings from rainwater and grey water systems installed in real houses, real measurement in real houses. Um, Contemporary studies, please, but if any historic data would be much appreciated too, and the bigger the sample, the better. Rewards available, probably in the form of cake. See me after this. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, a bit tight for time. <laughs> so, I'm being generally uh, the watch, but any quick questions? No. Oh, okay. One question. In your set in the first by six, Rob, thank you for that. That was good stuff. Very really interesting. Um, Raven Housing are an outfit that have done a bit of work on water efficiency and might have some case study material and some results. Okay. Might be useful. So I'll link through it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. That's so uh, now over to Andrew Tucker and Rosie from Thames to take us through the Thames project. Thanks, Jim. Um, this is a little bit different presentation. Rosie and I are going to do it too, but we, it's not a collaborative project. It's just a capsule of what we're doing at the moment, but it's segued very nicely from Rob there by linking it or highlighting the fact that it's become core business, it's increasing in scale quite dramatically. We do have an ODI, which is a nice term for a penalty. Uh, it scares the hell out of me. But this is just a couple of slides of how, what we're doing, why we're doing it, what we're doing, and some results so far. So um, 
First of all, I'm Rosie. Um, I'm going to take you through a little bit about why Thames Water um, is doing water efficiency. I'm sure it's the same for most companies, but just to give a bit of background. And then take, take you over a 